characters on the screen leave extraordinary adventures, being our exact depiction or creation made to serve a story. These digital humans, in the span of just a few decades, have made tremendous leaps in realism. And as our digital avatar is set to play an even bigger role in tomorrow's social interaction, I believe it's time to take a moment to review what we've done so far and explain some of the keywords, so that next time a rendering engineer comes into the room to talk about BSSRDF, we will have some ideas what he's talking about. But I also want to look into the future and the challenges that we still have to conquer, and hopefully convince you by the end that it all boils down to mastering one key effect. Hi, I'm Thomas and thanks for joining our talk. I will be your speaker today with Adi. And before we go further into this presentation, I want to establish a contract with you. You came to this talk hoping to get some insight into human rendering techniques, and with two engineers on stage, quite frankly, you may already feel the cold breath of heavy math on your neck. Well, here is our contract. No equation, no math. This talk is all about the concepts and getting an intuitive understanding of what's going on. Okay, so let's start with a simple core concept behind BRDF. Okay, jokes aside, BRDF is still where we will start. The BRDF is a bidirectional reflectance distribution function. And to make it simple past the barbaric name, it defines a relation between the light coming in and the light coming out of a surface. And we, we often represent it that way, a two-dimensional drawing with two loops representing the intensity of the light depending on the angle. One for the diffuse color and one for the specular highlight that will appear the closer the camera gets to a 90 degrees angle to the light. And we could stop there and model all our triangles are simple flat plane using a single normal. But that would fail any real world comparison. And this is because in reality no surface is perfectly flat. If you take a microscope to a piece of rock, you will see that the surface is actually composed of many smaller surfaces, all with their own normal. And that observation is the starting point of the microfacet theory behind which most of today's real-time physically based render are built. But maybe you are thinking, oh, hold on, hold on. No artist have ever modeled every single microscopic grain at the surface of a concrete slab. And no technical artist would ever in his right mind allow that to go in game. It turns out we don't really have to. With the power of mass, we can simulate that by adapting our BIDF and introducing a new function, the distribution function. And that function is crafted so that just by varying a single factor called roughness, we can influence the orientation of these facets. The rougher the surface, the more light will be scattered, and the wider the specular loop. And the smoother the surface, the more mirror-like the surface will be, and the narrower the specular loop. But how does that really apply to fabric, the main theme of our section? In 2000, Ashikmin made the observation that fabric could also be represented using microfacets. But to get the exact look, he had to adapt the distribution function. You see, fabric is not exactly composed of many small surfaces. It's actually composed of many small strands. And all these slanted, slightly translucent strands provide a higher specular highlight at grazing angles. And what we see here is a simulation of that effect. A board is rendered with a surface covered in small strands. In the first case, the light next to the camera, we observe a strong backscattering effect, where the light bounces inside the stream, back towards the light. And in the second case, with the light nearly behind the ball, we observe a strong forward scattering effect, with the light going through the strands. And this is most notable on velvet, a fabric composed of just these small strands, where the specular highlights have that very distinctive shape. There have been many improvements since the 2000s, an Ashikmin original work, but they all relied on that original mathematical construct. And past that distinct surface response, it's easy to see around us the challenges that are still left untouched. These microstrands also sometimes make for all the materials by influencing the silhouette and the depth of a surface. And past most common fabrics, these strand level details can account for most of the surface look. For some fabrics like damask or jacquard, multiple types of strands are interwoven to form complex patterns, all with different specular response and texture. An extreme example of that is shot silk, 
where two different color threads are woven in a particle pattern to achieve that changing color effect. And going further, some knitted wool pattern may even be impossible to capture with details map and simple shading tricks. Being able to run a fabric at thread level will dramatically expand the realm of surfaces available to us. Finally, to conclude our class section, I would like to bring your attention to one last aspect. Fabric are rarely fully opaque, and as a matter of fact, we took the easy route for too long in real-time rendering, as fabrics often exhibit some amount of translucency. The Cahousa dress falls on itself, and each layer participates in global occlusion. What problem is, translucency is hard, especially at that kind of scale and on a single mesh, and it has been hard and partially solved for a long time. Already back in 2016, Morgan McGuire made a full presentation on topics, which I highly recommend you check it out. And to make it simple, order independent transparency and its improvements, depth bound order independent transparency, are very costly, both in terms of computation and memory. Solving that problem at scale was, is, and still will be a major challenge in the coming years. The uncanny valley is a term that has been coined to describe that uneasiness feeling that comes with looking at a not quite realistic enough depiction of a human. And if that term has been widely overused, what it tries to describe is real. So millennia years of evolution and from our very first press, we've been conditioned to unconsciously recognize the faces and the millions of small details in it. Anything missing or slightly off will send alarms then ringing. Eyes, for example, are one of the most information-rich factors of human interaction. We spend an incredible amount of time looking into each other's eyes, and as such, any missing details will unconsciously be made obvious. There are two close-up rendering of a human eye, and between the two there is only a very small change. So if you focus on the right image, you will notice a little more light at the corner of the iris. That difference of light at the corner of the iris is called a caustic, the same effect that appears at the bottom of a pool when the sun hits the surface just right. The light, refracted on a cornea, gets projected onto the iris. If the effect is well understood, its application in real-time rendering can be challenging, as in order to produce a right result, every ray of light needs to be simulated. But we can use some tricks. In that case, following the approach introduced by Ruminez in 2013, the scattering is pre-computed offline in a past tracer, where each ray is simulated and baked into a texture. At runtime, the angle to the light is used to pick which slides in the three-dimensional texture should be used. Lookup textures are in fact nothing new in real-time rendering, and are actually a common trick for optimization to bake heavy calculation results. But with a bit of creativity in that case, we can also use it to further push the quality. And now, let's change our focus and do a little experiment together. Something I'm sure we've all done as kids. Take a flashlight and hold it behind one finger. And the light is not blocked, like it would by any other opaque objects. It seems to go through, lighting all your finger in red. And if we bring a section view of a skin profile, we can start to formulate an hypothesis as to why. Skin is composed of many layers, with varying thickness and density. Light, as it hits the surface, gets inside and propagates through the medium, exiting all over the surface. And that effect is what we call subsurface scattering, the action of the scattering the light below a surface. And if you remember the BRDF that we discussed at the start, it only accounted for the light reflecting on the surface. But what of the scattering we just discussed? Introducing the BSSRDF the bidirectional scattering surface reflectance distribution function. With it, we now have a way to describe the light entering the surface, scattering under it, and exiting on another point. But evaluating that new scattering component can prove to be more complicated than you may think. In real-time rendering, we estimate the light for every pixel on an image, one after the other. So how do we evaluate all the points from which light could have entered the surface in order to exit at the pixel we are evaluating. And since getting that information accurately in real time is impossible, we had to find solutions. One of which 
pre-integrated skin introduced at SIGGRAPH in 2011 by Penner attempts to tackle this by solving the problem beforehand and storing the results in, once again, lookup textures. It makes the observation by just by knowing the angle of the light to the surface and the curvature of the surface at this point, it is possible to estimate the scattering. The parameter space is then laid out in the texture, pre-computed offline, and then sampled at runtime. So not only does it give a proper approximation of the scattering, but it also captures the change of light colors as it gets absorbed by the melanin inside the skin. And this absorption factor is key to capturing accurately the wide diversity of skin colors found in the world. But you might be starting to wonder, as I open my section with this little experiment, how can we reproduce this when this method only works for light shining directly on the surface? In real-time rendering, we took the habit of separating these effects into the scattering parts that we've just discussed and the transmission part. The transmission works for cases where the light source is behind the surface. What we are interested in is the thickness of the mesh at that point. The distance the light will have to travel inside a mesh. And knowing that, we can apply a transmission profile to know how much light was absorbed in the skin and how much the color had changed. And getting the thickness of a mesh from the light is simpler than you may think, as the shadow maps are nothing more than a representation of the distance from the light to the closest object. And this works fine for most cases, because unless occlusion happens, this is the other side of the object where the light entered and transmitted through. This, however, works with the assumption that no other object is between the light and the surface being evaluated. So is there any way we could solve this to alleviate this limitation? Unless you are living under a rock or still rocking a voodoo card, you may already have experienced ray tracing in real-time rendering. Often confined to reflections, shadows, or global illumination, ray tracing has been underutilized outside of these areas. And one of the first tasks my team set out to do was experiment with ray tracing for human rendering in novel ways. And we chose to address the subsurface scattering problem. After experimenting with different approaches, we settled on something similar to what he had done for refraction in a Pika Pika demo back in 2018. During our forward pass, a set of additional G buffers are exported containing normal and world position information. And using that information, we can extract a list of rays to emit from the surface of the mesh towards the inside of the mesh, thus attempting to reproduce the travel of the light inside the mesh. And thanks to a caching scheme, we can emit just a few handful of rays every frame and accumulate the result over time in the UV unwrapped textures of the model. All of what we just discussed only barely scratches the surface. Skin lives with us. And when we exercise sweat spurs on it, when we are cold, goosebumps forms on the surface. And all these are effects that we still have to properly capture in real-time rendering. Things that participate in creating a truly realistic virtual human. And skin is not the only surface with scattering properties. Our teeth are composed of multiple layers. And if the scattering effect is crucial to get the proper tint, I want to bring your attention to something else. All these are covered in a small water layer. And that mostly transparent layer doesn't really change the base color, but it adds another specular. So let's bring back our loop diagram. And now let's add our water layer. And this new layer, as I previously mentioned, does not modify the diffuse. So we still only have one loop for it. But now we have an additional specular loop for the water layer. This loop is shifted up along normal to the surface to simulate light hitting the surface a little higher. You might be familiar with this effect under the term of clear coat when applied to architecture or car rendering. Thank you, Thomas. Hi. In this part of the presentation, I'm going to introduce you to the world of hair and the challenges bringing it to life. Like my friend Thomas, I'm not going to dive into the equations, but some of the slides will contain references and a more complete list will be presented at the end. I will, however, try to cover the basic principles for these topics. Let's start. As one can imagine, hair is not an easy problem to solve. It is extremely dynamic, contains tens of thousands of moves of its strengths, and its lighting is far more complex than anything we presented thus far. 
This is the main reason why most TV series, games, and even movies are still using what we call card-based approach. In this simplified approach, the modeler creates many semi-transparent geometric cards around the head to form the shape of the hair. The cards will be attached to the head and based on case might simulate animation and physics for added realism. We've seen great results with this technique in the past, so why isn't that good enough? Well, the poor artist will still need to spend many weeks to properly shape the cards, apply proper physics weighted properties and whatnot. So, pretty hard task. Yet at the end result, it doesn't quite get the exact behavior of the hair as we would have liked to. So, why not increase the amount of cards and refine their shape? Enter the strand-based approach. The strand-based approach started emerging over two decades ago, yet due to being so costly, many minutes per frame only started picking up in the past 10 years. Since then, much work has been done moving into the GPU, achieving better simulation, and approximating the light transmissions. Last year, it was published in O3D, and further improvements are underway. So, how does it all work? We start our journey with air creation and rendering before moving on to the lighting. Wouldn't it be great to model the hair the same way that the hairdresser is, well, giving you a haircut? Using GCC tools such as Maya XGen and Blender to create the strands, this is indeed the path that we're taking. Next, we export the strands to the GPU so we can run the simulation and the rendering. For the GPU, we compute animation and apply physically correct forces and collision to each strand. We can also introduce the concept of guide and follow strands to optimize performance. For each created strand, we run a complete simulation and alongside interpolate group of nearby follow strands to imitate the guide strand. Now that we've done that, we need to expand each strand to create a thin mesh facing the camera. Finally, we apply lighting and shading. Before moving to lighting, it will be wise to review the structure of hair in nature, so we can imitate the way light interacts with it. Hair is constructed of three layers. Outside layer made of cuticles that are thin tilted shells made of dead cells. The media layer is called the cortex. Its light absorption creates the hair color as we see it. Finally, the inside very thin inner marrow layer is called the medulla. Usually, this layer is ignored in our light. Okay then, let's talk some lighting. Since we target physically correct air rendering, we focus on the Martian lighting model. Introduced in 2003, this model is based on study of light distribution over hair and still considered by far the most accurate to date with some modification over the years. It treats hair as a thin long cylinders, tracking the path of light as it reflects and refracts from each strand. Each light ray energy is divided into three loads, R, TT, and TRT, and their energy distributions are summed up. Each ray lobe is split along two planes, longitudinal along the hair fibers, and azimuthal across the hair. The longitudinal portion is usually approximated as Gaussian distribution. For simplicity, the current model applies the first light bounce only. Loss of energy is small, but does exist. There are more than a few open questions left, and we will briefly go over them at the end of the presentation. Let's briefly go over the three lobes starting with the reflection lobe. This lobe is reflected without penetrating the surface and therefore does not carry or represent the hair color. It represents reflection of light usually arriving from the front or from the sides. As you can see, the cuticle affects the direction of the reflection. This is also correct for all other lobes. I invite you to think about the question, what if the current strand is not in front of the hair? We will get back to this question later. The second lobe we present is the TRT, short for transmission reflection transmission. The light ray penetrates the hair, bounces once, and then exits, usually staying at the same side as the entry ray, therefore representing light arriving from the front or the sides as before. Since the path passes through the hair, the absorption of the media represents the color of the hair. Lastly, the third lobe is called TT, short for transmission transmission. It represents light penetrating the hair, traverses through the media and exits through the back. Just like the TRT, the refracted ray carries the hair color. 
Unlike the previous two lobes, however, this lobe usually represents lights and GI coming from the back. And now that we've graduated the Martian lighting model, we can observe the effect of each lobe in the following reference brought by EPIC. Observe the R lobe as it usually appears bright and light, refracted from the front. The TRT lobe will present darker rich hair color. And finally, the TT lobes will present bright hair color as thin groups of hair are lit from the back. It's time to go back to one of the questions I asked you several slides ago. What about the energy of hair strands that are at the back of the hair? So far we've covered energy distribution for a single strand, but what about the energy over a volume of hair? How can we approximate the energy bouncing back and forth between strands without running a complete path tracing simulation? Many directions have been proposed to address this problem, employing the techniques ranging from crude approximation, deep opaque maps, dual scattering, LOD aggregations, and many others. This topic is still one of the main challenges to date. And what about the environment contribution of lighting? At least here, the answer is simpler. We can attempt to treat it as a source of light. But again, other questions are, how do we apply direction? What would be the normal that will take, etc. And finally, what about the energy from other contributions that we might have missed? For example, the multibonds within hair. As you can see, hair shading is not simple and yet to be fully addressed. Now that we briefly reviewed some of the challenges in lighting, how can we bring it to life in runtime? The list in these slides brings several of the main methods used, but specifically due to the increasing performance of current GPUs, we can now attempt to do that. This, however, would not be enough without many approximated distributed functions, as suggested by EPIC, Frostbite, and others, in order to reduce the computation time. Other directions include pre-computed distributed LUTs, adaptive trans control, light aggregations, and many other techniques. Finally, I present some of the future challenges in this field as I see them. We already mentioned the importance of correct energy distribution, and so our next goal is to refine hair under more unique conditions. For example, simulating wet hair doesn't only affect their reflectance, but also the behavior of groups of hair and groups of strands representing micro-interactions. And what about interaction with other particles such as sand and dirt? Damage hair will affect the cuticles, the medulla, and the tip of the hairs, and therefore change drastically the light distributions. Mud will introduce interaction both physically and in terms of lighting with the large masses combined with the hair. The future is definitely challenging. As promised, I present to you the list of resources, and with that I pass it back to my friend Thomas that will conclude our talk. Thank you. You might have picked up through the slides that most of the problems discussed here are related or at least partially related to translucency. But if there's one thing I'd like you to exist this presentation with is that almost nothing in nature is truly opaque. Look around you, light shines through leaves, microscopic hairs at the surface highlight the silhouette and aqueous layers subtly shift the specula. Future for human rendering looks bright. With ray tracing, virtual geometry, texture space shading, and many other cutting edge rendering techniques getting mixed mainstream traction, we have a whole new set of tools to use. And if you want to learn more about these topics, I've compiled a list of papers and resources at the end of the presentation for you to look at. Most of the techniques we presented here have been implemented in various games and presented at conferences, but reference implementations are lacking making it hard to improve and develop new algorithms. O3D being fully open source, we have a chance as a community to fix them. That's why HTC 2022 in November, we will release to the public, for researchers, game developers, and people from all communities, a gem with some of the techniques we discussed here. But more importantly, a gem to be used as a starting point to create a fully open source human rendering ecosystem. You can find all the information you need at that link, or check out Sandy's workshops that took place on Monday where it demonstrated the gems features. Now, so final words, and just before opening the floor to questions, I'd like to thank all these people that helped me make this possible. 